Hey guys, welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi, and today I'm here in person with Josh Rasmussen, none other than Josh Rasmussen, who is a very good friend of mine. And this is the first time that we're actually meeting in person. I'm super excited to finally actually like meet you in person. What's funny yeah, is that you. I picked you up at the, the hotel just now, and you were like, Cameron, I was entertaining this hypothesis that you were a green alien. And there's no one else in, on the planet, I don't think, that would say that to someone. Like, well, the it was exciting that the hypothesis was disconfirmed before my eyes. But when I shared that with you, you lo had this look like, Josh, are you serious? <laughs> that was my thought, too. Yeah, well. Oh, we should probably mention what we're actually talking about in this interview, which is we're talking, the title is, is kind of fluid, but we're discussing whether or not you are more than material. Are you just your physical body? Are you more than your material body? Is there something distinct between you and your mind or your thoughts? So yeah, that, that's what we're Yeah, and it applies not just to you, but also to you, Cameron, and to me, uh, presumably, right? So, so if, if any person is more than material, then presumably all the others, all the other human persons are also more than material. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. So it would extend not just to, to us, but yeah. to everybody. Because everyone's thoughts are, or experiences, and I suppose, is that something that we're assuming? I don't want to actually get on a, a tangent, because that makes me think immediately about planning his thesis that, you know, there's no good arguments for other minds. Well, so this is a nice point, because I was just going to say that many of these arguments about the nature of persons, the nature of consciousness, starts from the first person perspective. So you start thinking about my consciousness, mm -hmm. my thoughts. That's what you have, you have the most access to your own thoughts, your own feelings. And then after that, it becomes a further question whether the results of your analysis apply to yourself, apply to other people. And there are some interesting philosophical puzzles about how to extend that analysis, but um, usually you can get pretty confident about what's true about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can see that in others. Yeah. Oh, I should also mention that we're filming this at the CCV1 conference. I probably should have mentioned that at the beginning, but I'll just mention it now. This is our first conference we've ever done in person. Got an amazing lineup of speakers. And uh, hopefully this is just the first of many conferences we'll do. But I'm just super, super excited about uh, being here and, and being able to do this and, and meet so many of you guys in person. So let's, uh, yeah, let's get into the nitty gritty details. You even have some props for us. Should we get directly into those? Oh, yeah, I think so. I think it's helpful to start with a concrete example. So, you know, this is a, a nice concrete bit of reality here. Okay. This Lego piece. Yep. And you like to use props in your videos. Yeah, well, this kind of helps us to think about these theoretical issues. We can sort of anchor them down to something we can see, we can touch, we can feel. And I was thinking. Now you make me want to feel one. Can I have. Yeah, I've got a one? few others. You can okay. play with these okay. here. Okay. <laughs> Now build. I'm not going to be listening to what you're saying. I'm just well, you know, I mean, one question that you might ask is, um, would it be possible to build a thought using uh -huh. Legos? Now let's just assume, for sake of argument, that this Lego is not right now a thought, and it doesn't have thoughts. Okay. Now I know that's a grand assumption, but if we think of this as an example of a merely material object, mm -hmm. then we can characterize it in terms of third-person properties like shape. Um, position and space, its color, and none of these properties would be uh, thought-like. They wouldn't have the property of being about you. They wouldn't have the properties that thoughts would have. So you might think this thing is not thinking in and of itself, okay? But then there's this question, could we build a thought? So let's take some other pieces here. Um, let's say, you know, this isn't thinking, but like if we add this piece, are these together thinking? Uh, what do you think about what, what, what I think? Yeah, do you think that we could build a thought by stacking these Legos up together? Um, and we change the color? Yeah, so in these types of situations, my initial reaction is just like, obviously no. Okay. Obviously can't be done. Why, why are you thinking that? Because the building blocks, that's, it's probably like a, has to do with some kind of construction error, so that we don't have the right materials. Yeah, wrong materials. Yeah. yeah. And we can zoom in on this, and we can think about, well, why are these the wrong materials, okay? And there's three different theories that we can have about consciousness, hmm. and we can apply it to these materials, and then this will help us to think about other materials, such as maybe like this material here, mm -hmm. or maybe this material, <laughs> or maybe if we cut open this material, we find other material. 
and we see is there a relevant difference between these materials and these materials, okay? So would you like me to run through those three theories? Yeah, this is surprisingly blowing my mind already. Okay, this is so, great. well because one of my methods as a philosopher, as a truth seeker, is to start with what's clearest. Mm -hmm. So I think for most people it's pretty clear that this thing is not thinking just in virtue of its geometric uh, and color attributes. Mm -hmm. That's pretty clear. Okay, but now we can zoom in and we can try so to understand why that is. You just mentioned yeah. color and geometric shape. So shape and color, but what about like, you know, the substance, the chemical properties that it's made of? Maybe that's, the, the, that makes a difference. Yeah, we can, we can cut this apart. We can, we can cut this in half. You know, I don't have the but, so maybe, instruments, but we could, we could decompose it into its most basic atomic parts. Yeah, well, yeah. Maybe my, I guess my thought is maybe it's because we don't like, maybe it is the case that a certain type of, I don't know, brain material, whatever the chemi chemistry makeup is, yeah. like that is what could be conscious. Yeah, or, that or could be. As far as what I've said so far, yeah. that's a live option. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to get a little deeper. I'm going to talk about these three different theories, and then we'll come back to that, okay. that question. Okay. So one theory would be that um, the reason this is not thinking is because there are no thoughts anywhere in reality. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of a limitivist, uh, materialist view of reality. Which is not, like, it's not a, a view that no one holds. People do hold Right. There's view. a surprising number of philosophers. I've met some in person. Um, one whom I've not met in person, Alexander Rosenberg, I was reading his work recently, An Atheist Guide to Reality, and he talks about this problem of how something purely material could be about something else. And he, he thinks that clumps of matter can't be about other clumps of matter, but to have a thought means that something can be about something, so that therefore there are no thoughts. So that would be one theory. That would be one way of explaining why this thing is not thinking. It's because nothing's thinking. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the limitivist option. Um, that's not the most popular option among the philosophers of mind, but there's a surprising number of philosophers who've entertained that. Um, Paul and Patricia Churchlin, Daniel Dennett has a, a version of uh, eliminating at least the subjective or qualitative aspect of consciousness, that sort of subjective feeling. And um, so that, that's an option to think about. Okay, now, my reason against eliminativism is fundamentally that I think that we have a power, a special power, to witness our own thoughts and mm -hmm. our own mind. This is a kind of introspective power. Have a thought in your mind, focus on it, think about your thought, Think about it. Do you want <laughs> me to? Do you want to me to it. do this right now, or are you just like kind of telling a? Well, anybody can do this. So anybody who's watching this, you can, and you actually have to do the work. You know, don't don't take my word for this. You have to do the work to pay attention Focus to your consciousness. On Focus on your thought. Notice its attributes. And there are I list in my book on thoughts. Um, I've got a book on consciousness. I've got a chapter on thoughts, and in that chapter, I talk about five attributes of a thought that you can discover through paying attention to a thought in your mind. Hmm. You don't discover this by looking at brains. You don't see any of these attributes from looking at brains. You discover them only by looking inwardly at a thought. And you can notice that a thought will have a feature of aboutness. For example, the thought that Cameron is cool is about you. It's about Cameron. Okay? So there's an aboutness quality to a thought. Um, thoughts also have logical relations to other thoughts. So you can have the thought that Cameron is cool and Josh is cool. Now that's a complex thought that has an and link in there. Mm -hmm. We can replace the and with an or link. And and or are so familiar to us, but I mean like what is and? What is or? I mean th these are very special bits of reality and we access them through this introspective access to our own consciousness. So that's a second aspect of thoughts are logically linked. There's also a structure to thoughts. So snow is white has a structure. It combines the concept of snow, concept of white, combines them into an organized structure. Then there's a truth value. Thoughts can be true or false. And I've got a whole book on, on truth. So that's a topic in its own right. You know, what is truth? But that's something that you find out through introspective analysis. This gets, gets underneath science. This gets underneath all theories. All theories of reality uh, require this basic grasp of truth. Otherwise, you can't know if a theory is true or not. And then finally, there's a kind of um, what it's like to have a thought, this kind of subjective aspect to having a thought. So these are features, five features of thoughts. 
that you can uh, discover. And you don't discover them by looking at Lego pieces or looking at brains. You discover them by looking inwardly. And this is a reason that I'm convinced that thoughts are real through this introspective power. In fact, more convinced that thoughts are real than that you aren't a green alien, right? Because I might be hallucinating, right? Maybe you are a green alien over there, right? And I just am imagining that you're not. Um, I think you're probably not, but I'm crystal clear certain that um, I've got some thoughts mm -hmm. through introspection. And so this is the way that we eliminate that first yeah, possibility. The first, the, well, so yeah, the first explanation. To for, try to bring it back to the, the yeah. Legos. So these, these Legos aren't thinking. One reason to explain that is that nothing's thinking. Um, I think that theory is too simple. It doesn't account for all the data. It doesn't account for my thoughts. So I don't think that works. The second idea is... Well, let, yeah. let's stay on that for just one second because, I mean, it just seems so obvious. And, th and that's kind of like what you were just getting at. Like, just think about your own thoughts. Think about the properties of those thoughts. Yeah. And so you're just telling someone to, to do some introspection. But like, how, so how does someone like Alex Rosenberg yeah. get to the conclusion that, you know, there are no thoughts? and Because I mean, he's coming to this conclusion... But if he doesn't exist, yeah. So how, how do they like avoid that? It just seems so obvious. I appreciate this question. And when I was in graduate school studying the philosophy of mind, I began reading these articles um, talking about the problem of consciousness. There was an article by Peter Unger who talked about the problem of understanding how he could exist. Mm -hmm. Now, later in his career, he ends up arguing from his existence to the reality of consciousness that goes beyond the physical world. Um, but he was really thinking, how could, there, how could there be consciousness in a fundamentally physical world? Now, I don't want to overstate my own confidence here, even though I have to be honest and say that I am confident. But I, I don't want to overstate it and well, give Well, that's the important to do that, right? Because you want to be honest about how confident you are. I want to be honest about how confident I am, but I also want to be honest about how much respect I have for a limitivists really grappling with consciousness and mm -hmm. really trying to understand how there could be something else beyond the physical world that's fundamentally, it's something that we don't find in fundamental physics. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, aboutness, um, truth value, logical this, links. This is really interesting. It's making me think about like, what is the fundamental nature of reality? Is it mental or is it physical? Yeah. Or, or I, I suppose like, we were actually talking about this a little how bit too. How do you define like, physical? How do you define physical? And then should it be like, should we even title this video? Like, are you pure, purely mental or purely non-mental? Or I don't it might know. Might be a false dichotomy. But what I was, but what that made me think about is maybe he's so certain that there's non-mental reality, you know, and then and then you grapple with this problem, and so that leads him to think that you know non-mental reality is the the sort of fundamental thing, and there's no mental reality. There's also an emphasis. But then it's like going back to the what we were just talking about, like your just introspect on your own thoughts. Yeah. It seems like that is like you would be way more confident that you have thoughts than that there is this sort of non-physical realm. If you can trust, or non non mental realm. If you can trust introspection, so there's there's a whole literature on the reliability of introspection, and um, kind of what happens here is there's an emphasis on scientific inquiry that emphasizes your empirical senses like seeing, touching, um, tasting. You know the, these these senses, and there's a question about whether introspection is reliable or how reliable it is. There's also this question about how we can explain the sort of common folk talk about consciousness. This is sometimes called folk ontology. And what some philosophers have done is they've worked out another theory. It's a kind of error theory that explains why we're actually making a mistake when we talk about thoughts as real subjective realities. But then you're right, that means that we can't be relying on this sort of introspective access. Um, to our consciousness. And so that's kind of where the debate lies, is can we justify the reliability of introspection? Our, our but in order to do, it seems like you're kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. This is the argument I ended up making in my book, is that you actually need to use introspection in order to, to even evaluate. know that you're making observations yeah. in a scientific inquiry. Because that depends on a kind of introspective access to the sense of your own senses, mm -hmm. the sense that you're actually seeing something. You know, you sort of There's take it for granted. There's something very problematic about yeah. using your your introspection to rule out your own in introspection. Yeah. Some, you know, I'm, That's I'm, right. yeah, yeah. I'm making it oversimplified, but. Yeah, no, it's, so there's deep problems. So I, ultimately, I do think it's self-defeating. Okay. 
Um, but there's well, a healthy yeah, discussion on that. Yeah, and um, lest we spend too much time on, you know, because we could each one of these different. I'm we thinking could of keep like diving deeper. And I'm deeper thinking of a tree. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of an of an analogy, and it, it helps me to when I do interviews to like think about all of the different things that are being discussed in an interview. So we start with like the trunk of the tree is yeah. and then I'm looking at the roots because the, the roots are going down deep into what's like sort of holding the tree up. Yeah. So we, we went down these different like paths of explaining why these building blocks are not mental. And then we started looking at, you know, introspection and your thoughts and yeah. sort of ruling out eliminativism. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah, that's right. And so we're, we're going down all these different paths and we could discuss each one of those more and look at more and more roots. But we probably need to get back to yes. and, uh, so, discussing and this the is other good to go deep enough so that we can point to the complexity. This is not an easy topic. Yeah, and, and it's one of the reasons why I've I've stayed away from it is because I feel like it's so. It's it, in my book. I use the metaphor of a cave of consciousness. It's a cave, and we go in with lights of introspection and reason and science, and it takes a lot of careful work. I mean, it's not just sort of immediate that you recognize, oh, there's five aspects of thoughts, mm -hmm. at least those five. Yeah. And then each of those aspects can be further analyzed. There's aspects of the aspects, you know, and, and it takes work. It takes work to actually do, to think about your thoughts and to identify those aspects. So what are these three, because we, we've only discussed one of them. Yeah, so we got So the, we eliminate everything. So limitivism, there are no thoughts. Another one would be a kind of reductionism where what it is to be a thought just is to have this shape or some other shape or some color or some molecular structure. So we, we reduce... Or to be made of some kind of... To material. be composed of some geometric structure. Um, so a kind of reductionist account. Um, and then the third one would be that there's something about consciousness that's not reducible to material things. So it's kind of, you might call it irreducible conscious aspects. Mm -hmm. So those would be... And the there three. are physicalist theories of the irreducible there are, yeah, so there's a wide range of theories that might account for how to say that they're irreducible. Um, my project has been to show that the first two theories, eliminativism and reduction, have severe problems. And okay. So we have to go to a kind of irreducible consciousness. Okay, let's get to that yeah. in just a second, but I want to ask just kind of like an empirical question about the number of people that hold these views. Yeah. What would you say like the percentages that are eliminativists? I'm, I'm always going to pronounce say that wrong. Yeah, so in Phil surveys, they did they did a, um, I don't think it was fine-grained enough to look at eliminativism. I don't quite remember. I'd have to check. Okay. Um, but my impression, just from being in the field, going to conferences, talking with philosophers, reading the, the literature, is that eliminativism is not, it's not a main physicalist view. But there's a surprising number of eliminativists. Okay. Um, reductionism is also one that is it still it's sort a of very on the minority? rocks? It's sort of on the rocks, I would say. Okay. Um, there are some reductionists, but it, it looks to me that the kind of general trend in the field over the last 50 to 70 years is toward understanding consciousness as real and irreducible to uh, material aspects. Third yeah, person and, material aspects. And let me just say this. I wasn't trying to like th build an argument from, you know, consensus yeah. or anything. I was just kind of curious, like, what is the landscape of the, you know, in the academy? academy yeah, world? no, it is so fascinating because there is a kind of dominant physicalist uh -huh. uh, view. Uh -huh. And you have physicalists in one camp arguing against physicalists in another camp. And so they're throwing bombs against each other's positions. And I'm sort of standing outside of that framework. Right. Finding it very fascinating to see the problems with eliminativism, the problems with reductionism, the problems also with deriving. If you have a kind of non-reductive physicalism and you derive consciousness from shape, you know, I mean, th think about this. I, I, for me, when I think about the Legos, it like helps me to really get clear on what's at stake. It's like think about this Lego and, and think about a thought about snakes. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I, I don't think there's any chance that this Lego is thinking about snakes. Yeah. I, I don't even think there's a slim probability of that, all right? You think it's zero? I, I think it's zero because I think, well, unless this Lego is different than what I think it is. If this Lego is fundamentally a mental being mm -hmm. and that this shape is just a manifestation of some deeper mental substance, then maybe it is thinking. Well, see, I haven't even considered... But if it's fundamentally just merely material, then I think it's not even possible. What I'm thinking about is uh, panpsychism. 
Yeah, so it, it could be that you know Thomas Nagel has got this theory that everything, even like atoms, have some kind of level of consciousness. Yeah, so there's a kind of panpsychist view that every that there's consciousness at every level of reality. Yeah, and there's again different ways of of unpacking that, but even on that view, I think the best version of that view is going to have some kind of substance that's conscious or mental or spiritual or something like that. It's not going to be itself built fundamentally out of uh, mindless units of reality. If we think of this as fundamentally built out of mindless units of reality, it is sort of as it looks. It's got shape, it's got color. Then you can ask, okay, well, is it thinking in virtue of its shape? And you can get very specific. I think it's helpful to get specific. Think about this rectangular shape. You know, I can just, so, sorry, I, I can yeah. just imagine someone watching this and being like, why are we even asking if this Lego has thoughts? Well, because, okay, look, look, Cameron, Cameron. <laughs> it's just so if obvious we get that clear, it doesn't. If we, if we can get clear about this, because then you can start applying irrelevant differences. So you mm -hmm. can say its, it's rectangular shape is not the right kind of shape to mm -hmm. make it think about snakes. Well, changing it to a square, changing its color, that's not a relevant difference. That's not going to make the difference. Yeah. You, you relocate it, put it in a brain, mm -hmm. you make it more complex. When I was in college, I thought, well, just a matter of complexity. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it, making a very complex... Like if you just had, if you just had a ton Legos, of Legos. No matter you built them look, how many look Legos like you put together, you will never generate a thought. And I think you can see this. Not just empirically, I think not, there is good scientific evidence for this, but also I think you can see this by reason itself. I think I've asked this in another interview we've done. Is this kind of like the Chinese room experiment? Similar to that. Similar to that? And that in there you Maybe have... Maybe explain that real quick. Yeah, so in the Chinese room experiment, you have some, some guy in a, in a room. And this guy does not speak Chinese, but he's got this book of all the rules, of uh, syntactical rules of, of um, you know, if somebody says this, Here's something you can say in response. Mm -hmm. So somebody who does speak Chinese sends a message into like a slit into the room. And this guy receives the message and he um, has no idea what he's reading. But he looks up in the book. Um, Finds the right formula. Our, our formula for response. And then he uh, pulls out a piece of paper or copies, you know, the response, sticks it out the slip. And then the guy reads it. Now, the book is functioning, the, the whole room is functioning as if it understands Chinese. This is John Searle, and he's beating up against functionalist accounts of consciousness. He's saying that function is not enough to account. Syntax, acting as if you understand something, is not the same as actually consciously, from the first person perspective, having the sense, oh, I understand Chinese, mm -hmm. right? But it is functioning as if it understands Chinese. So the problem there is if function were enough, then you'd have to say that that room does literally understand Chinese. And, but that, that seems absurd. It doesn't seem like the room is literally understanding Chinese. At least from that first person perspective, it seems like there's something more to understanding. We know what it is to understand. We have the experience of understanding. And by that experience, I think we can see that function is not enough. Yeah. How does that tie into the, the Legos? Well, so again, it just shows that Complexity, um, function, syntax, rearrangement um, is not going to be a relevant difference. If this Lego is not thinking in virtue of its shape, then giving it a more complex shape or even a function of shape inputs to shape outputs is not going to be enough to make it think. That doesn't seem yeah. to be enough. I wonder, so there's, there's two ways you could make it more complex. Is you could add more Legos, and that's one way. Or you could even take this one green Lego and cut it up into tiny pieces, yeah. and then reorganize that into like a brain-like structure. Yeah, and I think you can build actually, a brain out of Legos. Yeah, yeah. that makes me think of uh, you. I, I don't know. I don't remember exactly when you said this, but you were thinking about consciousness one day, and you saw like dust particles flying through the yeah. air, and you were like, "Are those dust particles conscious?" Yeah, I saw it through the sun and the air, and I was like, "I'm if I'm certain of anything, it's that those dust particles are not thinking thoughts." Right yeah. Now. Right? There's also this binding problem, like, well, which particles are bound together to have that first person experience? Is it these 20 over here or is it these 15? Right? And so even if those dust particles look like a brain, even if they're shaped like a brain, even if they're functioning like a brain, that's not by itself enough. Now at this point, Cameron, there are people watching this and they are itching with an objection, a neuroscience objection. Okay. They're thinking, 
Okay, Josh, you can speculate philosophically, but we know the brain generates consciousness. We know that consciousness comes from the matter of the brain. So maybe consciousness doesn't come from Legos, but we already know, maybe it's a mystery how this happens, but we already know somehow the brain is doing all the work mm -hmm. generating consciousness. And here... And I don't think they would necessarily just need to be relying on neuroscience. Right. They could say, the, the, one of the problems that's raised all the time is the uh, interaction problem, is that what it's called? Yeah, sure. Yeah, dualism interaction. It's like, how, how does that actually happen? How does yeah. the immaterial interact with the material? Yeah, how that's is it one, that's possible? A, yeah, that's a big issue that's raised a lot. So it wouldn't be necessarily that, you know, it's just like relying on the facts about neuroscience or anything, or like a consensus of what neuroscientists think. Yes. It'd be like, there's also this problem of interaction. How does that interaction take place if it does? Yeah, there are a number, there are a host of, of different um, problems and questions that one can ask. And oh, also, and then uh, another one I was thinking about, sorry, to, I, I, keep, yeah, go, I feel please. like I'm interrupting no. you a ton. Uh, it, another one is like, you know, if you get a uh, brain injury, yeah. that really affects your personality. And the brain could, death It affects argument. your thoughts, yeah. Yeah, and all this, I think what it shows is there is a correlation between the brain states that the, the third person material structural states mm -hmm. and these conscious states, there is a correlation there. Um, but there's different ways we can analyze that correlation. Um, so, you know, we talked about the three views, the eliminativist view, the reductionist view, and the something more view. Um, you, uh, if, if, if there's a correlation, then you don't want to eliminate consciousness because what we're saying is consciousness is real, but it's and correlated. There's a correlated, yeah. yeah. Um, but that doesn't entail the reductionist view. It, it's sort of like if, if I'm listening to music, my wife is playing music on the uh, piano, and she's, she does a great job of this, and I'm listening to this. There's a correlation between the piano keys and the sounds I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. But the sounds I'm hearing aren't the same as the piano keys. In fact, we can demonstrate this because we could actually move piano keys in the same way without there being those same sounds. If it's not hooked up in the right way. Mm -hmm. So you could just take all the strings out of the piano. Yeah, you could take the strings out. Um, or the sun rises and then roosters crow. But the sun is not a rooster. The rising of the sun is not the crowing of a rooster. So there's correlation. There's not thereby uh, reduction. Mm. So um, I think that actually what the neuroscience is showing us from my reading of the neuroscience is, and it's really fascinating, Cameron, because they're talking about quantum brain theory where there's consciousness through thinking, through mindfulness, that's having an impact in changing the structures of the brain. You can heal your brain, you can build your brain through certain mental disciplines. And they're not actually finding physical correlates to explain these physical changes. That doesn't mean in principle those physical correlates aren't there. But it, what it shows is that there's an interpretive option here that allows for consciousness consistent with all that we know from neuroscience that consciousness is, is not reducible to brain structure and may actually be causing brain structure uh, without any physical mechanisms to explain that. So maybe that's one way to understand the correlation issue, but then what about the other one, the interaction problem? So that, you know, this is a very deep problem. My own account of uh, mind-body interaction is, I call it a substance view. Uh, so I developed this in terms of substances having basic capacities to generate thoughts, feelings, mental imagery, as well as the kind of states that we might associate with material states. Um, I'm still kind of working through how, I, I, how to think of matter. What is the fundamental nature of matter? Bernardo Kastrup, he, he understands matter as a kind of extrinsic appearance of consciousness itself. So that's kind of an intriguing idea that matter is itself fundamentally a reflection of consciousness, the very nature of matter. Um, I'm kind of leaving that open at this point, but basically I think that if you have a substance that's capable of generating consciousness in a basic way, then it could also generate other states and correlate those states together. So that you don't get, you don't get shapes generating consciousness, and you actually don't get thoughts generating shapes directly. What you get is a thinking substance or a thinking being that's capable of generating both the brain as well as conscious states.
that, I was, that makes sense. I was gonna say that it seems like this interaction problem is like, so how do we, how do these things interact? And that's yeah. a, it's a question about like, maybe the sort of mechanisms that are involved. Yeah. There's just a real big gap in our knowledge of how this works. Yeah, right? in general, I mean, how anything interacts. Well, yeah, yeah. but yeah, and uh, that's one yeah. that's one of the ways that I've thought is like, how do we even know that like material, how do material things interact with that? each other? Yeah. That's super weird too, is especially when you get down to like, you know, quantum levels and stuff. It's like, exactly. how does any of this stuff work at all in the first at place? At some level, there's just something basic. Yeah, but the, the other thing I was going to say is that like, y y what we were talking about at the very beginning yeah. of this, it's like, how does consciousness come out of the brain? Yeah. You know, how, if we can't just like put shapes together or colors together and get consciousness. So like, it doesn't matter who you are, you're still going to get to a place where you just don't understand how that happens. Yeah, well, and I want to just say that I don't think consciousness can come out of any purely material structure, any material. So, so whether it's Legos or a brain, none of that's going to be sufficient. That's why I think what you need is the right kind of substance. And this is where, um, I, whether we call this a mental substance, a conscious substance, spiritual substance, it's the kind of thing that can generate consciousness, it can think, it can feel, it can even generate the imagery of a brain. So I think the conscious substance is going to be prior. Um, so when people talk about consciousness coming from a brain, mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's that's how I would I would analyze. I don't think strictly conscious, I don't think purely material realities anywhere of any shape, size, form, or structure could ever in principle produce thoughts or feelings. Maybe or this is a good way to wrap up the interview is to just talk about that a little bit more. How do you get to that conclusion yeah. that material stuff can't even in principle produce something that's conscious? Yeah. Because that can lead, you know, it doesn't necessarily lead to dualism. Right. Right. It could just lead to that, you know, mental reality is fundamental. Could be that that's right. idealism is true or some, you know, some other sure. theory. Yeah. And, and my own view is a kind of substance monist. So I, I think I'm one substance. Um, but I do think there's a dual aspect or dual properties mm -hmm. um, in terms of you know, conscious properties and material properties. But yeah, so Cameron, this is the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah. When I was in graduate school, I was fascinated when I discovered this problem that they named it. This is Chalmers coined the term, the hard problem. It's like, it you is know, a hard problem. <laughs> could, could, could there be a more creative name, right? It's like, <laughs> let's just call this the hard problem, right? <laughs> and um, it, it's the problem of explaining first person subjective experiences out of purely third person geometric uh, structural uh, properties. And what Chalmers observes is that if we understand that consciousness is real, we don't eliminate it, and we understand that its reality is witnessed by our own first person experience, so we're seeing it as it is, mm -hmm. there's a real aboutness, there's real truth value, there's real logical links, there's real subjectivity, we see that then we can also see that there's nothing in the third person material reality that in and of itself allows us to deduce or derive consciousness. And this is why Chalmers is thinking that consciousness is a basic feature of our reality. It's fundamental. And a number of other philosophers think this, that it's a basic feature of our reality. It's mm. fundamental. Now, I would go further. I would actually say that not only is there this hard problem of explaining how you could get consciousness from geometric third person reality. But there's that deep construction problem that it's actually just categorically impossible. It's actually possible to see through reason. I don't claim this is easy to see. I feel like I've, I've come to see it with a greater clarity after working through my book and thinking about the specific elements of consciousness, thoughts, feelings, value itself, seeing these things that you can just see that, that you can't construct them out of um, just third person bits of matter. Yeah. And I think this is why you have Alexander uh, Rosenberg saying that clumps of matter can't be about other clumps of matter. I think he's actually seeing rightly. He's taking the hard problem seriously. He's taking it seriously, yeah. So here's the last question I've got and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Is you've, y you and I have talked at length on numerous occasion about the argument from contingency yeah. for God's existence. But as I understand it, put, please put the Legos down because they're distracting me. <laughs> uh, the, the argument from contingency is my favorite argument for God's existence. Mm -hmm. But lately, I, I think I asked you this or you, you mentioned it the other day, is it like the argument from consciousness is, is more powerful to you these days? And it's like a, a more clear link 
to God's it, existence? It, it makes this sort of materialist frame where mindlessness is fundamental just absurd to my mind. And, and, and it didn't always seem this way. I remember when I was in college not thinking this at all. But the closer that I inspect it, the bigger the problems are. You know, there are some problems in philosophy where you inspect it and then it sort of falls away on scrutiny. Consciousness is not one of those things. The more I inspect the aspects of consciousness, the more it just breaks the materialist frame for me. That, that sort of mindless foundations, um, that you know, rationality itself, mm -hmm. this conversation, our ability to move our limbs and, and to think rationally, that, that all of this is just a product of this mindless motions. Um, there's not only just probability problems there, but there's just this in principle construction problem. It's, I think, the same insight that leads me to think that those Legos aren't thinking thoughts and could never think thoughts no matter how I arrange them. It's sort of that same clarity that I have about no matter how you rearrange the matter, mm -hmm. it's just not going to think. And it just, it clicks. It's just, it's something that does seem very compelling to my mind. I've yeah. said like five times that I'm going to end this, but I don't want to. So uh, I'm thinking about Graham Oppie's view of the foundation of reality, yeah. which is like that it's all necessary or like everything, all the different possible worlds go back to one initial thing that yeah. is necessary. He doesn't want to say it's God or has any kind of mental properties or consciousness or anything. So how would we tie this argument into, because he, he accepts the first stage of yeah. the contingency argument. So how would this inform what we think about the nature of fundamental reality, like the necessary part of reality that grounds everything else that's contingent? Yeah. No, how this would is, this argument sort of bridge that gap, right? That, that's kind of the, no, this is one of the biggest question, questions. Cameron. Is, is I, I've been thinking a lot problem. about this because Oppie's view is, is beautiful. Uh, he talks about how reality can come out of this initial item that has a necessary existence. And then there's this further question, okay, well, what's the best account of, that, of the nature of this item? Well, if we go with the consciousness is fundamental, then this fundamental item That's is like going to have some basic link. consciousness, right? And, and a number of philosophers are saying this who aren't theists in, in their background. You have um, philosophers from a variety of physicalist perspectives who are saying that consciousness looks like it's a fundamental aspect of physical reality. Now, if this initial item is, has necessary existence and it has fundamental consciousness, I actually don't mind calling it physical. I mean, what does the word physical mean? I mean, Cameron, I'm, I'm reading these quantum field theorists and they're talking about the fabric of physical reality as being informational, observer-dependent, relational. I'm thinking, well, observers can provide the relata of the relations, uh, transcending space and time. This is the nature of, of physical reality, Yeah. right? And I'm thinking, okay, well, we can call that physical reality. Maybe this would be a helpful way of bridging a gap here and just saying, yeah, the best account of physical reality is that it's conscious um, or it's got conscious aspects, mm -hmm. fundamental conscious aspects, has necessary existence, it's got enormous power, and, um, you, you know, the word physical is, is a term of art, but it's, it's real, you know, it's a real... Thing. And I think that is a way of maybe bridging the gap in the stage two of the, the argument of, from contingency. Mm -hmm. It's another route, this sort of argument from consciousness. It, it's different from my argument from shaving off the arbitrary limits, looking for the simplest uh, account of it in terms of a supreme nature. But it's sort of mutually reinforcing. It's sort of like yeah. a, a web with many lines that reinforce each other. In your book, How Reason Can Lead to God, you kind of just look at all of these different aspects of reality that kind of point back to the yeah the, fun, the the foundation having these these sort of divine properties yeah and then this next book on consciousness i just zoom in on this one aspect consciousness and i divide that aspect in many different aspects and i find that all those different aspects that was kind of the discovery for me was to see that each aspect thoughts feelings um, value uh, even our ability to choose each one in their own way is a flag that points or is a sign, I don't know what the best metaphor is, but each one points independently to the role of mind as prior to these elements of consciousness. Hmm. This has been really helpful, I feel like, and very insightful. I think that we originally talked about doing uh, a, this completely different, but I'm glad that you had the, the props and stuff and you brought those. Yeah, thank you. I think we covered the, the topics. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Make sure to like, subscribe, and do all the things on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube.
which you most likely are if you're listening to it on the podcast. Thank you guys for listening, and we will see you later.